God's word together. We look to you, Father God, for encouragement this morning as we journey in faith with your precious Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Speak to us from your word, we pray, and change our lives. For your glory's sake, we ask. Amen. I'd like to uh, divide our time this morning um, looking at uh, Psalm 122 and alongside uh, some verses from the Hebrews chapter 12. So if you'd like to have your, <coughs> your service sheet with the uh, psalm and perhaps a Bible uh, with, that, um, with that passage from Hebrews 12, we're going to spend half uh, our time in each this morning. Just one or two headings as we uh, go along, um, which I hope um, will uh, enable you to follow where we're going. First of all, verses 1 and 2 in Psalm 122. Um, overjoyed to reach the city. Overjoyed to reach the city. I hope you can see and have been able to see in these last um, uh, two, three Sundays, um, the eternal perspective for our faith journey, your faith journey, my faith journey. Through the encounters and the experiences of these pilgrims, I feel that we have travelled along with them. As they set off, if you remember in Psalm 120, they were singing about their problems and their struggles. That's how, they st that's how they set off. That's how they started. Then in Psalm 121 last week, they were keeping on in their journey with God as their security, their provider, their keeper, and their guardian as they travelled. And this week, Psalm 122, the pilgrims arrive in Jerusalem. So you can imagine their excitement what started as a lament ended with verse 1, I rejoiced with those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. And on arrival in verse 2, our feet are standing in your gates, O Jerusalem. There might well have been dangers on the way, but they have made it. Let us uh, worship in God's house, they said. So if you're all glad to be in church this morning uh, to worship the living God, then Psalm 122 and this passage from Hebrews should be an encouragement uh, to you. Gathering together to worship is at the heart of our Christian life. Psalm 122, if you haven't already noticed, is of course all about Jerusalem. There in these verses are past, present, and a future Jerusalem. First of all, old Jerusalem. It was King David who brought Jerusalem into Israelite hands, and with the building of the temple, it be became known as the city of David. Many years later, under King Hezekiah, it was sacked and set on fire by the Babylonians, and that was about 600 years before Christ. And you can read about that in 2 Kings 25. And then present Jerusalem, Psalm 87, for Caesar time when any number of different peoples will claim a birthright in Zion. How true that is. And then the future Jerusalem. Well, I think that's about the new heaven and earth, promised in Revelation chapter 21. And we'll be looking at this a little bit later on. So they were overjoyed to reach the city. So let's have a look at the building of the city, shall we? Verses 3 to 5. Look down at those verses. The phrase closely compacted together in verse 3 might suggest to you the density of the housing, stones in walls. But another translation says bound firmly together. And that referred to the various distinctive tribes um, coming together 
in unity, if not in uniformity. They were all tribes of the Lord. Miles Coverdale, in the prayer book version of the Bible, of verse 3, sees a city that is at unity in itself. I like that, a city that is in unity in itself. And in some measure for us too, as we gather together and we welcome each other back into church after many months of COVID restrictions. It's good to be here. Our church fellowship will, of course, will need some rebuilding itself. We are to be, again, the living stones that Peter speaks about in his first letter, chapter 2. Stones, each one of us, that are being built into a spiritual house, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For these pilgrims were blessed in that it was compulsory. They had to go on three pilgrimages every year, given um, by Moses in the book of the law. I was thinking about this. It had been so in our country with the Act of Uniformity of 1551, when church attendance on Sundays and holy days was compulsory. You had to come or you would be fined. And I wonder, maybe it would help us still if that were so. What if it was compulsory for each one of us to be uh, here every Sunday? Maybe it would help us. If it, it's so easy to say, isn't it? I don't feel like going to church today. If we need any encouragement, and we're here, so I guess we don't need too much, but uh, Eugene Peterson, to start with, reminds us that worship does not satisfy our hunger for God. It whets our, appet our appetite. Let me read that again. If I can find it, here we are. Worship does not satisfy our hunger for God, it whets our appetite. And Selwyn Hughes, some of you might remember him in his Every Day with Jesus, once said, God is thinking more of us than himself when he bids us to worship him. C.S. Lewis, worship is inner health made audible. How good is that? And in worship, the dwelling of the Holy Spirit in the believer is what Augustine called an alleluia from head to toe. Now, I really like that. Am I an alleluia from head to toe? Are you uh, an alleluia from head to toe? Someone once said of worship, that it is an action which develops our feelings towards God rather than feelings towards God which develops into an act of worship. It is action first. We decide to come and worship God. And I was thinking too, what would encourage our dear Francis as he returns from his holiday? I'll tell you what it is, to see the church full, the church gathered together, and in verse 4 of our reading of that psalm, to praise the name of the Lord together. <clears throat> so when you're speaking to friends who you know come to church, tell them that next week we're going to be here. I found a helpful definition of judgment. Have a look down at verse 5. The decisive word by which God straightens things out and puts things right. How much we take for granted the peace and the justice at the heart of our, com our country and our communities. We literally have nothing to fear. So the building of the city, the building of uh, those precious stones uh, living stones of worship. 
And now the blessing of the city, verses 6 to 9. Have a look down at those verses. Jerusalem is a place of strife and tension between Jews and Muslims, Palestinians, Israelis. For the city called peace, peace is fragile. Regular disputes and reprisals of various kinds arise together with the unwillingness to compromise. Notice in these verses the use of the word within. That's an important word. And here, intercessory prayer at the deepest level is seen as absolutely vital. These verses say, ask for them. Ask for peace, security, prosperity for those who love Jerusalem, for the sake of each other, and for those brothers and sisters and friends. Bless them in fervent prayer. And as I thought of those words, we should be praying for Afghanistan this very day, fervent in prayer, when our minds go to what we see, the terrible things uh, on the news at the moment. The blessing of the city was fervent prayer for Jerusalem, and it still is. So now let's have a look at this heavenly city uh, in Hebrews. So if you'd like to take up your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 12, and I'd just like to read the verses that I'm going to refer to. Just let me read those uh, to you. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God, You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all men, to the spirits of righteous men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? So the heavenly city. Just as the pilgrims of these psalms that we've been looking at arrived in Jerusalem, we too have arrived in Jerusalem. But for us, it's the new heavenly Jerusalem. But you might say to me, how have I already arrived? I'm still alive, I'm still on life's journey, I'm still a pilgrim. The Lord Jesus hasn't returned, so how can you say to me, you have arrived already? How can this be? And in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22, we read, You have come to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, to the city of the living God. So let me ask you an important question that arises from verse 24. Have a look down at that verse. Let me ask you simply, Have you come to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel? Moses, as we heard, brought the old covenant and trembled with fear. Jesus brings the new covenant that we might draw near to God in confidence through him. Have you come to Jesus? Are you trusting that his blood shed on the cross has paid the price for your sins? Have you? If your answer is yes, then the writer of the Hebrews tells you without any doubt that you have already come to Mount Zion, present tense, to the city of the living God, Picture this city, thousands upon thousands of angels 
in joyful assembly to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. If you have come to Jesus, believing in his covenant, your name is written in heaven. There's an old hymn that I love, Glory Be to Jesus. And these are the words that certainly help me. Abel's blood for vengeance pleaded to the skies, but the blood of Jesus for our pardon cries. The first letter of John, some familiar words affirm this truth. If we walk in Jesus' light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his Son, purifies us from all sins. And that's a continuous sense. Purifies us, purifies us, purifies us from all sins. And if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If you're sitting there thinking, well, I haven't sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word has no place in our lives. This is 1 John uh, 1, verses 9 and 10. This is about personal and individual salvation, and it's also about your place in the true and living church, the living stones of the true church. Coming to Jesus ensures your name is written in heaven. And you and I are meant to be assured of our place in our Father's house. Jesus speaks about this and John records it in his Gospel, chapter 14. And Jesus says we are to trust the Father and the Son in this matter. A few more words from that lovely hymn, Glory Be to Jesus. And this is my own testimony. Grace and life eternal, in that blood I find. Blessed be his compassion, infinitely kind. You see, I know my name is written in heaven. A place in heaven I could never earn and most certainly don't deserve. This is essential for our eternal peace and our security, yours and mine. We should take seriously the warning of verse 25. See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. Yes, one day our pilgrimage on this earth will be over, either by our death or the return of the Lord Jesus. Now we can see, can't we, why the pilgrims set off singing about their problems yet with the promise that they would be provided for on the journey, and though there would be problems on the way, ultimately nothing would stop their arrival. And so they kept going and joyfully arrived in Jerusalem. Can you see from this that whatever the struggles and problems we encounter on life's journey, if you have come to Jesus already and you know that Jesus is your saviour, you will arrive in the new Jerusalem. You will arrive. Your name is written in heaven. The timeline is eternal. And what is that timeline? For the, from the moment Jesus became your saviour, into today and tomorrow and into eternity. But meanwhile, before we see heaven in its fullness and experience that joyful assembly, I think Eugene Peterson got it right when he said, what is required of us is long obedience in the same direction knowing that we're on our way to heaven, experiencing and enjoying the blessings of heaven here on earth while we wait.
What a wonderful promise. Let's pray. If we haven't done this, Lord Jesus, <clears throat> help us to put our trust fully in you this day. To heed the warning of your word. We want to come to you, Lord Jesus. We recognise that your precious blood cleanses us from all unrighteousness. And that in coming to you, already coming to you, that our names are written in heaven. We bless you and thank you for these wonderful psalms and for the promise that we have. That in you, Lord Jesus, we have eternal life to be with you forever, to be where you are so we can be. Amen. Thank you.